is good to be here talking to you today, uh, digitally, remotely, from a distance. I'm glad that all of you are able to attend this and that you are uh, surviving these strange times we are in. Uh, today's topic, what we're going to be looking at and discussing this afternoon, is prohibition. Uh, now, there are two things about prohibition that I want to highlight. One, why are we talking about prohibition today in 2020? Well, this year happens to be the 100th anniversary of the start of prohibition. It went into effect in January of 1920. And when we talk about prohibition, well, what was being prohibited? Why do we have this, this period in American history? The thing that was being prohibited, the reason why it's called prohibition is because in the 1920s, uh, going into the early 1930s, alcohol was illegal in the United States. And we'll talk about how we got to that point and the impact of that on American society uh, as we move forward in our discussion. Now, the story of prohibition actually has a, a, a long backstory, a long history from at least the early 19th century. There was in American society uh, a movement called the temperance movement that sought to eliminate or at least reduce the use of alcohol among Americans. One thing about the early United States uh, from the colonial period into the revolutionary period into the early 19th century is that we as a people liked to drink. We drank a lot, men, women, children. People drank beer, they drank cider, some drank harder alcohol, rums and whiskeys and that sort of thing. Alcohol was everywhere. It was an important part of American society, American uh, cuisine. So what we begin to see in the early 19th century through a period of religious revival and reform movements is that the temperance movement emerges, the move to eliminate or at least limit the consumption of alcohol in American society. Now, why would the temperance movement want to do that since alcohol was everywhere? Well, the temperance crusaders, as they were known, saw that alcohol was the root of all evil in society, or they blamed everything on alcohol. Poverty was due to alcohol. Crime was due to alcohol. If you were a husband and you beat up your wife, it was because you were an alcoholic. If you lived in abject poverty in the urban centers, it was because you'd spent all your money drinking rather than looking for a better livelihood for yourself. So they tied the sins of society with the sins of alcohol. Uh, we see that illustrated on the cartoon on your screen on the, uh, the left, which uh, is from a, a periodical called The Bottle, a temperance um, magazine. And it shows the drunken husband coming home aghast to the fact that his wife has been murdered by him while he was in a, an alcoholic rage. So you have this belief that alcohol caused the sins, caused the problems in American society. Now, the figure on the right-hand side of your screen is a person who becomes famous uh, and really one of the faces of the temperance movement. Her name was Carrie Nation. Now, Carrie Nation had a um, somewhat tragic life. She was married young, but her first husband dies of alcoholism. When she gets married again, uh, she becomes one of the most ardent, one of the most uh, radical of the anti-liquor figures in the temperance movement. She um, basically becomes kind of this, this polarizing figure in the effort to get rid of alcohol in the United States. Now, if you look at that picture carefully, you'll notice uh, two things. In one hand, she's holding a book. That book is the Bible. In the other hand, she's holding a hatchet, uh, kind of an incongruous um, pairing there, the Bible and the hatchet. Well, why was that? It's because Carrie Nation gains fame or infamy uh, from her actions. She was such an ardent anti-liquor person that uh, she gains a reputation for her actions. She used to go into saloons and taverns, particularly in places like Kansas, with her hatchet and her Bible, and while quoting biblical verses or singing biblical hymns, smash the bar up with her hatchet. Uh, she becomes, as I said, infamous for these, for these actions, for going and destroying 
these properties. Now she's arrested many times, but she always gets out by paying the fine that's associated with this. Uh, she generated a lot of money on her speaking tours and through writing, but she does become this notable figure in the struggle to get rid of alcohol. Uh, the cartoon you see on the screen kind of um, makes fun of Carrie Nation. Uh, it says, I cannot tell a lie, I did it with my little hatchet, which of course is playing on the, the, the mythical story of George Washington chopping down the cherry tree. Here you have Kerry Nation smashing up the bar. So the story of prohibition really goes back to these temperance reformers and the belief that alcohol was a social evil. By the time we get into the late 19th and early 20th century, the idea of temperance is growing. There is broad support in certain parts of the country for temperance, for getting rid of alcohol. And we see the issue of alcohol starting to become political, particularly on a local and state level, but it is a question that is asked on the national level. So you see images like the ones on your screen emerging nationwide. That group of women in the upper left, lips that touch liquor shall never touch ours. The men voting in the uh, parade down below, vote dry. And of course, the eternal question when it came to temperance, should we be a wet state or a wet town or a wet county or whatever, or a dry town or county? Uh, we see that posed in that political poster on the right, wet or dry. Uh, and that poster kind of plays on our emotions somewhat. It asks, do we want to support the wealthy brewer, the gentleman on the right hand, uh, left hand side there, or do we vote dry to get rid of alcohol for the benefit of the children? Shall the mothers and children be sacrificed to the financial greed of the liquor traffic? Uh, very uh, powerful statement, very powerful question right there. It's up to you, voter, to decide. So the issue of temperance, the issue of alcohol, does become not just a social question, but a political question. And it's a mo movement that spreads across the country. Now, obviously, in certain places, it was going to be hard to get rid of alcohol at a local level. The seaport cities, for example, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, where you had lots of sailors and lots of people coming in, you were going to have alcohol. But there were places in the United States that were dry, either dry counties or dry states, places like Utah, for example. So the question of the consumption and sale of alcohol was one that was resonating across the United States. Now, the real impetus to the to the push for getting rid of alcohol in the United States actually emerges uh, because of two different things. One was immigration. Many immigrants in the late 19th, early 20th century were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, places like Italy and Poland, and were coming into the seaport towns of the United States. Now, what the Italians and the Poles had in common was religion. They were Roman Catholic. And Wine does play an important aspect in the Roman Catholic religious ritual. They also came from countries that were traditional drinking countries. Italians like their wine, the Poles like their alcohols. So you had this uh, idea that immigrants came in, immigrants liked to drink. So you had nativist groups in the United States, anti-immigrant groups in the United States that said, if we get rid of alcohol, that will force the immigrants to leave or not come here. And that would make the nativist groups happy. You also, by the 19-teens, 1914, 1915, 1916, have the growing concern about World War I. Now, World War I breaks out in Europe in uh, August of 1914. The United States at first stays out of the war. We are watching very closely what's happening there, but most Americans don't want to be involved in the war. Yet by late 1916, early 1917, the American public is kind of changing its opinion on involvement in the First World War. And in April 1917, the United States does go to war. We declare war against Germany and Austria. So we become part of the struggle. Now, what did that mean? It meant that the government here at home started to uh, conserve resources started to crack down on civil rights and against protests, but also started to conserve food resources, things like grains. Grains, which of course were necessary for the production of certain alcohols. So what we see during the First World War is the lack of accessibility for alcohol because many of the products that were needed to produce it are being 
um, are, are being kept by the government for the war effort. So there is this gradual, in 1917, 1918, kind of uh, ad hoc dispersal of alcohol in the United States. That gave political strength to the, the temperance crusaders, to those who wanted to get rid of alcohol entirely. They were arguing that alcohol was already hard to get, we should just get rid of it entirely. And a proposed constitutional amendment begins to make its way through Congress in 1917, 1918. Well, by January of 1919, 36 states have ratified that proposed amendment, meaning that it does become uh, an enforced part of the Constitution. It does become the 18th Amendment. So on January 16th, 1919, the 18th Amendment is ratified. And what does that do? Well, as the headline there on the American Issue says, the American Issue, by the way, was a, a temperance prohibition uh, newspaper, the U.S. is voted dry, a momentous day in world's history. The 18th Amendment basically said that after one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within, the importation thereof into, or the exportation thereof from the United States in all territories subject to the jurisdiction thereof, for beverage purposes, is hereby prohibited. Um, now, what does all of that mean? It basically says that you can no longer have intoxicating liquors. Well, what's an intoxicating liquor? That'll need to be uh, defined through legislation. And it notably states for beverage purposes. Now, what does that mean? It means that certain types of alcohol were exempted from the 18th Amendment, from prohibition. Uh, medicinal alcohols, for example, and sacramental alcohols were, uh, were exempted from the, the Section 1 of the 18th Amendment. Now, Section 2 says the Congress and the several states shall have concurrent power to enforce this article. What does that mean? It meant that the federal government and the state governments both were responsible for enforcing prohibition. So the 18th Amendment is ratified in January of 1919, goes into effect by the terms in January of 1920, which meant that Congress had a year to address that issue of intoxicating liquors and address the issue of how to enforce the 18th Amendment. So what we see happening in 1919 is a lot of activity in Congress dealing with the issue of prohibition. In October of 1919, a piece of legislation known as the National Prohibition Act, uh, popularly known as the Volstead Act, named after Congressman Volstead, who we see there on the screen, uh, the Volstead Act is passed. And what the Volstead Act did was it gave muscle to the 18th Amendment. It kind of filled in the blanks that were left there by the amendment. Uh, one of the things the Volstead Act did was define what an intoxicating liquor was. It defined intoxicating liquors as any beverage that had more than one half of 1% alcohol. One half of 1%. Now, uh, how much alcohol is that really? If we look at uh, a modern beer, you go get uh, Sam Adams out of the fridge or something like that, uh, that has about 5 to 7% alcohol. So intoxicating beverages by the term of the Volstead Act were anything that had more than one half of 1%. That is barely any alcohol at all. So the Volstead Act defines what an intoxicating liquor is and becomes essentially the operative arm of prohibition, the operative arm of the 18th Amendment. It's the Volstead Act that gave teeth to enforcement that def defined what could be enforced uh, as the terms of the 18th Amendment are carried out. So by October of 1919, we know what an alcoholic beverage is, we know what the powers of Congress and what the powers of the states are, and we wait for January of 1920, when prohibition does go into effect. In January of 1920, with the 18th Amendment becoming operative, uh, the scene that you see on the screen is essentially what happened. The United States kicks alcohol out of the country we become a dry nation. That meant that it was illegal to produce, transport, purchase, consume alcohol in the United States. We had essentially achieved the goal of 100 years of temperance activism. 
we had become a nation that sought that was going to try to eliminate what many viewed as the the cause of social problems alcohol was no longer legal in the united states so this goes into effect now in practice what did that mean it meant that law enforcement agencies actually had to begin enforcing prohibition had to begin enforcing the volstead act so what we see in 1920 are um scenes that that kind of saddened me uh barrels of beer being dumped into the sewers and into the gutters bottles of whiskey and rum and other alcohols being smashed by uh, government agents this became a very common scene in 1920 as the supplies of alcohol that were still available in the united states are uh, essentially gotten rid of they are hunted down and local authorities eliminate the um the booze the beer and the whiskey and the rum it is what you see on the screen the enforcement of the volstead act the enforcement of prohibition now the volstead act um as often happens with uh, american legislation the enforcement of it fell more heavily on the common people of the united states uh, the wealthy somehow managed to find a way to keep the alcohol that they had. Uh, it's notable that the president of the United States, um, Warren G. Harding, who becomes president in 1921, uh, had a fully stocked wine cellar at the White House while he was in residence there, even though it was during the period of prohibition, even though he was uh, responsible for enforcing the law, he managed to um, avoid enforcing the law for his own personal uh, consumption. So you do have this enforcement going on across the United States. Now, the problem that we begin to see emerging was that the Volstead Act gave broad enforcement authority to the states and to the federal government. And oftentimes those enforcement officers were perhaps a little bit too enthusiastic in carrying out their tasks. Uh, crashing into warehouses and destroying stock that might not have been illegal stock. And occasionally you had accidental um, incidences where law enforcement perhaps was overzealous, I guess we could say. And that's what this cartoon on the screen is criticizing. You had the law enforcement officer, dry enforcement there, who uh, apparently has gunned down a citizen because maybe that person had alcohol on them maybe they didn't in the meantime behind that cloud of prohibition the wealthy the powerful with their top hats and their glasses are kind of saying oh well sometimes things like that happen uh it's an image that kind of has a lot of resonance in today's american society but uh, we don't want to delve too deeply into that in any case law enforcement does begin trying to enforce prohibition, trying to enforce the Volstead Act, at first with some success. The problem that they begin to run into is that most Americans still like to have a drink. Most Americans didn't necessarily support prohibition and they wanted to be able to get a drink. So what do we see happening? Well, entrepreneurs uh, begin to find a way to uh, provide what the American public wanted. And we begin to see uh, in the cities and towns across the United States, the rise of illegal drinking establishments that come to be called the speakeasies. The speakeasies were essentially underground illegal um, or extra legal bars and taverns and nightclubs where uh, people in the know, people with, co with connections could go and get a drink and get some entertainment and that sort of thing. You see some images of speakeasies there on your screen. Speakeasies were often places where you had, uh, you know, dancing girls and jazz music and, and that sort of stuff. The upper image shows that group of revelers holding uh, a sign that said, in compliance with the 18th Amendment, no intoxicating liquor allowed on the premises, yet they're all hoisting glasses and have a wine bottle and that sort of thing. The image on the right, the gentleman seated at the piano with the dancing girls, kind of gave this allure to the speakeasies. People wanted a place to go. People wanted to have a drink. They found means of 
getting that drink, going to these speakeasies. As I said, these were uh, present in towns and cities across the United States. Uh, cities like New York and Boston and Chicago, for example, become notorious for their speakeasy culture. Uh, one of the things about the speakeasies is that they were designed to evade law enforcement. So often to get into one, you had to know a password. You had to know uh, the secret knock to get in. And if you look at the image on the lower left, the gentleman knocking at the door there, you see there's a peephole in the door where whoever's on the inside is looking to make sure that that person coming in is not law enforcement, that they are there uh, to get a drink and not to bust the people inside. And because the speakeasies were illegal institutions, they were often ingeniously designed to be very quickly hidden. If the police did show up, if they did launch a raid, the speakeasies could be very easily disguised. Uh, oftentimes speakeasies were located in the basement or in the back room of legal uh, businesses. The butcher shop or the dentist office would have a speakeasy in the back room. And when the police showed up in the front, the back room could quickly be closed up. The liquor could be hidden. The, the uh, gam gaming tables, if there were any, could be covered up. And it would look like a regular room, a legal facility, rather than an illegal den where alcohol was being served. So we do begin to see with the enforcement of the 18th Amendment, more and more Americans starting to become willing lawbreakers. The 18th Amendment was supposed to fix the issue of crime and reduce the, the occurrence of crime in the United States, but instead it turned many Americans to become willing lawbreakers. I want a drink, it's illegal for me to get a drink, but I'm gonna get a drink anyway. Now the question to be asked at this point is, where were the speakeasies getting their alcohol? How were they getting booze? Well, they were being supplied by an elaborate network that develops across the United States, a network of bootleggers. Now, who were the bootleggers? They were the ones who were uh, carrying the illegal alcohol from production facilities to the cities, to the distribution points. The bootleggers themselves were often um, willing risk takers, I guess we could say. Often young men, sometimes young women who were willing to take a risk in this, this dangerous enterprise to provide what the American public wanted. And in doing so, the bootleggers themselves were often very, very ingenious. Much like the speakeasies could be easily disguised if law enforcement showed up, the bootleggers developed methods of transporting alcohol to evade law enforcement. And you see a couple of examples of that on your screen. For example, in the upper left, that lumber truck, which looks for all intents and purposes like a legitimate lumber truck, was actually designed to carry alcohol. It had a hollowed out cavity in the back where you could stick your bottles of rum or your bottles of beer and cover it up and nobody would suspect anything. The uh, image on the upper right, the uh, Model A, I believe it's a Model A Ford, which was modified to be able to hide all of those bottles of alcohol that you see arrayed in front of it, hiding in different compartments in hollow floorboards and things like that so that the booze could be transported and the police would have, or law enforcement would have a harder time of discovering it. Uh, and that lower image on the right, that young lady with the long winter coat was simply wearing a disguise to facilitate the transportation of alcohol. Uh, and the second image there, you see that her coat is removed and around her legs, she has these metal holsters, which were designed to hold several bottles of alcohol so that she could load up on alcohol, lower her dress, put on her winter coat and deliver booze to where it was going to be sold, where it was going to be consumed, a method of disguising that transportation. And that final image, the lower left, shows a couple of the young men that were involved in the business of bootlegging. Now, one of the, um, key elements of the bootleggers trade was that you had to have fast cars. You had to have cars that were able to avoid and evade the police. So what you begin to see are a lot of young men souping up their cars, putting bigger engines in there, making them more maneuverable and faster so that if they were confronted by the police, they could outrun the police. Now, what you end up with essentially are a bunch of guys, young men with fast cars. And when they weren't uh, distributing alcohol, when they weren't bootlegging, they were sitting around. And as young men often do, they were bragging. 
my car is faster than your car. No, no, my car is faster than yours. Well, how do you settle who has the fastest car? You race them. And what we see emerging out of bootlegging in these young men with fast cars is the beginning of um, modern auto sports in the United States. In fact, NASCAR, the modern uh, racing circuit in the United States, can trace its origins to uh, bootleggers in North Carolina racing their cars in their spare time. So we see that as a legacy of prohibition. Now, um, some bootleggers do end up making a tremendous fortune in uh, the industry. They take a lot of risks, they invest in it, but they make tremendous profit. In fact, uh, one of the most famous bootleggers in the United States uh, was a guy from Massachusetts named Joseph Kennedy, whose son, John, would later be president of the United States. Joe Kennedy made a substantial part of his fortune through bootlegging during the period of prohibition. So we have the bootleggers bringing the booze to the speakeasies. Well, where are the bootleggers getting their alcohol? Now, some of the alcohol was imported into the United States, um, illegally, of course. Oftentimes, you would have ships coming from Europe who would come to within the edges of the coastal waters of the United States, these ships loaded with crates of rum or whiskey or wine or whatever, they would dump the crates into the waters. And then bootleggers with boats would come and retrieve those crates full of alcohol, bring them to shore, and then distribute them to their, their network of uh, rum runners and bootleggers. But we also begin to see a domestic production of illegal alcohol. During the period of prohibition, we have one of the uh, periods of one of the peak periods of illegal domestic alcohol production with the moonshiners and the bathtub ginners. Now, moonshine has a long history in the United States. Moonshine was essentially a grain alcohol that was produced by people living in the mountains of Appalachia way back in the uh, 1700s. And it was a means of uh, consuming surplus grains, grains that were too heavy, too bulky, too costly to transport to market. You would just turn them into alcohol. So there was a long history of producing grain alcohol, moonshine, in the United States. By the end of the 19th century, however, the government had begun to crack down on moonshiners. They began to crack down because of excise taxes. The moonshiners weren't paying taxes, the government wasn't getting their cut, so the government cracked down on the production of moonshine. Once prohibition was instituted, however, the moonshining business picks up again in the backwoods of North Carolina, in the, the forests of Texas. You know, people began to produce moonshine to, to feed the demand for alcohol in the American cities and in American towns. Prohibition also gives rise to the production of bathtub gin. Now, what is bathtub gin? Gin alcohol cannot be produced in a bathtub. It has to be produced in a closed system, a distilling system. The reason why the alcohol that was produced in uh, apartments, such as in that middle image you see there, or in houses in American cities gets the name of bathtub gin is because as the gin producers, the alcohol producers were filling their bottles, they would fill them part of the way with the, the grain alcohol that they were producing and then top it off with water. Oftentimes, the only uh, faucet in a house that was tall enough for a bottle to fit under was the, the faucet in the bathtub. So the bathtub gin gets this name from the bathtubs because they were used to top off the bottles. Uh, so you see this illegal domestic production of alcohol taking off with the ratification of the 18th Amendment, taking off to satisfy the demand for alcohol that we see spreading across the United States. So you do have domestic alcohol production, but it was illegal. And the fact that it was illegal and the fact that it was unregulated actually made moonshine during prohibition and bathtub gin tremendously dangerous. The distillers who were producing this product weren't necessarily looking for a quality product. They were looking to make a profit. So what we see is that they begin to adulterate the the alcohol. They begin to use products that aren't necessarily safe, products that could be toxic. Um, uh, for example, there are, there are it, it was known that some bathtub gin was made from wood rosins and that 
oftentimes these alcohols, when they were consumed, would lead to blindness or paralysis or even death because they were essentially a toxic chemical. Um, so you had these impure alcohols, these unsafe alcohols in many cases, being sent out, being consumed by the public, leading to death, leading to blindness and, and illness. Uh, because there was no government regulation, there were no standards of purity, yet the demand by the American public was there, and it was growing for alcohol. And you had people uh, filling in, stepping in to fill the demand through illegal production. So what we begin to see as prohibition is, is taking hold, as law enforcement is enforcing the Volstead Act, is that an entire ad hoc network to provide alcohol to the American public springs up. From the illegal production of bathtub gin to the, uh, the, the rum runners and the bootleggers to the speakeasies, people could get alcohol. It was illegal, it was often unsafe, but there was a supply available for the American public. And it starts to become tremendously widespread. In fact, after the first few years of enforcement, uh, it became almost an unwinnable task for law enforcement authorities. There was no way that they could stop all of the alcohol, that they could destroy all of the alcohol, dump all of the beer into the sewers. And it just became kind of an open secret that people were drinking. These two contemporary cartoons kind of highlight that. Uh, the one on the left says there's two types of men in this town, bootleggers and customers. That was it. There was nobody enforcing. You, there are people supplying the alcohol and the people consuming the alcohol. The one, image on the right, the cartoon on the right says, east side, west side, all around the block, the bootleggers rush in business at all hours of the clock. You have the customer going to purchase some illegal alcohol with the police officers walking by and kind of ignoring the entire scene because it had become so difficult for law enforcement to keep up with uh, it's enforcing prohibition that it was easier just to ignore it. It was viewed as a small scale crime oftentimes, so there's no, no use in trying to prevent that small scale crime. That second image, however, also highlights the fact that by the middle of the 1920s, and through the growth of this illegal distribution network, we do begin to see the rise of organized crime. The mob begins to gain power, begins to gain wealth. Now, it's important to note that prohibition did not create organized crime in the United States. There had been, for probably more than 100 years, uh, crime organizations in the urban centers of the United States, in the countryside of the United States, groups that dominated certain areas, certain neighborhoods of cities. What prohibition did was it gave a, uh, a, a tool for these local gangs to become wealthier and become more powerful. What we see in the 1920s is that organized crime groups begin to take control of the distribution and sale of alcohol within their neighborhoods, within their cities. And by controlling that item, they gain tremendous wealth. And with wealth, they could buy political power, they could buy protection from law enforcement. So prohibition was actually fuel for the growth of organized crime, for the growth of mobsters in the United States. On your screen, you see a few images from this period, from the the mobster era of the 1920s and early 1930s. Uh, individuals who through the controlling of prohibition and then other illegal activities, gambling and prostitution, and stuff like that, do become tremendously wealthy and with wealth gain political power. Uh, of course, organized crime was often tied to violent episodes such as the infamous St. Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago, which you see illustrated in the picture on the, uh, the left. Because of that, law enforcement had to become more heavily armed and more heavily aggressive. So you begin to see um, organized crime taking action, being more violent to protect their turf than their protect their, their, their product, alcohol, and law enforcement having to take bigger steps, more drastic steps to try to combat organized crime. Now, 
what emerges out of this is that you do have some individuals who become tremendously wealthy, tremendously powerful, and tremendously famous because of their involvement in organized crime, because of the control they eventually establish over cities. One of the most famous of the mobsters of the Prohibition era in the United States is, of course, Al Capone. Al Capone uh, rises from being a, a street thug to at the height of his power, virtually controlling the city of Chicago. Uh, and he makes that rise through ruthlessness, through ability, uh, through eventually controlling the distribution of alcohol in Chicago, and uh, by ruthlessly eliminating his enemies in the city. At the height of his power, Capone was bringing in tens of millions of dollars a year from his criminal enterprise. And he, as I said, he virtually controlled the city of Chicago. He had uh, mayors, judges, police officers, all on his payroll. He could do whatever he wanted in the city of Chicago. That's how powerful he was. The federal government tries to take down Al Capone, but they can't pin any of his racketeering crimes on him. They can't get him for murder. They can't get him for the distribution of alcohol. Uh, they can't get him for gambling or prostitution or corruption or any of that thing. What eventually brings down Al Capone is income tax evasion. Uh, he is eventually arrested by uh, the federal government because of income tax evasion. He doesn't pay taxes on his income. He ends up in uh, Alcatraz out in California for a short time before he's released and he ends up uh, living his life out at his estate in Florida, where he dies a gruesome death from um, syphilis. His brain essentially turns to mush and he dies at the age of 47 or 48. Uh, but during his peak years in the 1920s and the early 1930s, he was a force, a power in the city of Chicago. Capone, of course, is the most famous of the mobsters of that time period, but he is certainly not the only one. You had others like Lucky Luciano, who was an Italian immigrant who uh, was involved in the mob in New York. Bugs Moran, who uh, was also a gun runner and a, um, a bootlegger. Uh, Nucky Johnson, who controlled pretty much the entire state of New Jersey during this period of prohibition. You had Meyer Lansky, who uh, was a banker and a financier and a gambler. And Arnold Rothstein, who really gains infamy in 1919 for um, supposedly organizing the Chicago White Sox throwing the World Series in that year, the infamous Black Sox scandal. So you had these other gangsters who become wealthy and powerful because of prohibition, because prohibition allowed them to, to stretch out their tentacles into new enterprises to bring in more money, to bring in more uh, more power to their organizations. Many of these men meet, do meet gruesome deaths or unpleasant deaths because being a mobster is a violent business. But you do see the rise of these individuals with tremendous wealth and tremendous power because of their involvement in those illegal activities. So prohibition is nationwide law, but most Americans, many Americans broke the law. They wanted alcohol, they wanted a drink. And by the end of the 1920s, as the country is descending into the Great Depression, um, the desire for alcohol becomes more widespread in the United States. And we begin to see protests like the ones you see there on the screen of people wanting to eliminate prohibition. Now, why would you want to eliminate prohibition? One is you're in the middle of the Great Depression and it would be nice to have a drink probably. Um, we can kind of see what's going on in modern American society today in 2020 and how alcohol sales are booming. But also because if we could get rid of prohibition, that would mean potential jobs in the United States. All of the breweries that were starting up would need employment. All of the distilleries would need employment. You would end up having distribution networks and marketing networks that would have to be set up, which could lead to more employment for American citizens. So what we begin to see are these public protests against prohibition across the United States. Um, they really pick up toward the end of the 1920s going into the early 1930s, but even as early as 1920, 1921, there were protests against prohibition. These images so show some of those early protests. Um, the image on the left has American veterans who had fought in World War I protesting against prohibition. Uh, you can see some of the signs they're, they're carrying. 
Uh, the one on the left says foreign vessels now carry our tourist trade, all getting American dollars. Prohibition is ruining our merchant marine. 6,000 American vessels are tied to the docks. Four million American soldiers fought for liberty and were, re were rewarded with prohibition. How come? And the last one, to Congress, you care for our crippled soldiers. Our morals will care for themselves. Many people are saying that prohibition was, it was government overreach. How dare the federal government try to legislate our morality? How, how is it right that we who went and fought for liberty in Europe during the First World War come back here and don't have liberty? So we see protests asking for beer, asking for prohibition to be eliminated, saying, you know what, if you have alcohol, you can tax the alcohol, that would bring revenue into the, the government. So there is far reaching protest against prohibition. Um, there were those that were radically in favor of it, there were those that were radically opposed to it. Eventually, what happens? Well, in 1932, we have a presidential election. And we see Herbert Hoover, the incumbent Republican president, uh, who many people blamed for the worsening economic crisis of the Great Depression. Hoover is running for re-election. He is being challenged by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, governor of New York, former undersecretary of the Navy. Roosevelt is selling a spirit of optimism. And one of the things that Roosevelt is agreeing to or promising the American people is a repeal of prohibition. So the election of 1932 is essentially an election based on the economy of the United States. Uh, Hoover not doing anything to end the Great Depression. Roosevelt saying, we'll do something to end the Great Depression. And Roosevelt is elected president in 1932. With Roosevelt's uh, rise to the presidency, his, his inauguration in 1933, Congress begins putting in motion the mechanisms to repeal prohibition. That comes to, rat to, to fruition in December of 1933 with the ratification of the 21st Amendment. The 21st Amendment very simply says, the 18th Article of Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is hereby repealed. The Prohibition Amendment is repealed. It is no longer operative. But it does go on to say, the transportation or importation into any state, territory, or possession of the United States for delivery or use therein of intoxicating liquors in violation of the laws thereof is hereby prohibited. What that means is that it was now up to the states, the individual states, to de determine whether or not they would be a dry state or a wet state. The 21st Amendment gets rid of nationwide prohibition and makes it a local issue. Uh, and there were many states in the Union that would remain dry states up until at least the late 20th century. Utah, I think, was one of the last dry states. And there are still parts, counties and towns in the United States that are dry counties or dry towns where you cannot get alcohol. It is a local issue. It is not a national issue. Nationally, prohibition ends with the ratification of the 21st Amendment in December of 1933. So what does that mean? The 21st Amendment is ratified. The nation is in the midst of the Great Depression, but it's still a moment of celebration. And what we see with the ratification of the 18th Amendment are, in fact, celebrations across the country. People can at last go out and legally have a drink, legally have a beer. After 14 long years of dealing with prohibition, uh, you now have this moment where it is no longer illegal. So you have images like this, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Inquirer, the headline there, Prohibition's 14-year rule ended, prices high, supply low in Philadelphia. Uh, the people cheering at the bar on the upper right image, farewell 18th Amendment. Uh, it's notable that in that image, people are hoisting glasses of beer. That woman in the foreground is hoisting a gigantic glass of beer, uh, the size of a trophy almost. Uh, the Daily Mirror down there at the bottom, Prohibition ends at last. The 21st Amendment undoes the 18th Amendment. It ends nationwide prohibition. It made it legal, once again, for people in the United States to purchase, produce, consume alcohol. Uh, and many people thought that happy days are beer again. Now, what is the legacy of prohibition and the 18th Amendment? Uh, one of the things we see coming out of prohibition is the failure of government to legislate morality. You can't at least the government can't make people act in a way that the government wants them to be in terms of their moral behavior. Um, prohibition, 
for all intents and purposes, is a failure. It does lead to the mass of Americans becoming willing lawbreakers. It does lead to the amplification of the power of organized crime. Uh, it does lead to far-reaching economic changes in the United States. But as a model for enforcing morality, for preventing Americans from getting the things they wanted, it is ultimately a failure. In many ways, prohibition can be compared to the war on drugs of the 1980s and 1990s. The war on drugs was a federal effort to prevent the sale, the importation of illicit narcotics into the United States. The federal government spent billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, militarizing police forces, militarizing agencies of the government to try to combat the drug trade. How successful was the war on drugs? Did it prevent the flow of drugs into the United States? No. People who wanted drugs could still get drugs. Uh, it, in many ways, echoes the failures of prohibition in that it led to escalations of violence rather than uh, tearing down the structures of violence. So the legacy of prohibition is complex. It is controversial. The idea behind it, let's get rid of this thing that causes problems in American society. Sure, that was noble, but it was an idea that could never successfully be implemented. That is um, pretty much where I'm going to stop my discussion. That is where my story of prohibition ends. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody. So if you have questions, you can feel free to ask. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Anybody want to go to the fridge and get a beer? <laughs> I have a question. Sure. Um, I've read or been told that it was legal for individuals to brew beer for their own use. Is that true? I believe if you were doing a small amount, you could do that. Um, you could brew your own beer, but I don't know how widespread the production of, of home brews were at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't believe it was something that was happening very often in the cities. It may have been something that was more rural than it, what we'd see in places like Boston or New York or, or Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Uh, maybe Thank in you. the country people um, would especially do their own cider because af after all, Johnny Appleseed mm -hmm. was spreading that not so people could bite into a delicious apple, but so that they could make Applejack uh, at cider um, because they used that as uh, their beverage, you know. In, in many agricultural parts of the United States, the, um, the use, the production of alcohol was tied very much to daily life. Uh, because oftentimes farmers had, you know, if you were growing corn, you can only consume so much corn. You can only transport so much corn to market. What do you do with your excess corn? You don't want to leave it rotting. So you turn it into something that lasts a long time. You turn it into an alcohol. And in many parts of the United States, uh, particularly in the late 19th, uh, excuse me, late 18th and early 19th century, that alcohol that was produced was used as a currency on the frontiers because that was more readily available than, than federal currency. Uh, if you look back to the 1790s and the Whiskey Rebellion, which takes place out in Western Pennsylvania, the Whiskey Rebellion occurs because the federal government, George Washington's administration, tries to collect an excise tax on the production of whiskey. The farmers out in Western Pennsylvania who grew grain uh, often turned their excess grain into whiskey and used that to barter, used that as a medium of exchange because again, it was more transportable, it was more durable. The Whiskey Rebellion was a tax revolt against that excise tax that was imposed by George Washington's administration. So um, yeah, I mean, you would have people out in the countryside producing those types of products. For personal consumption, again, small scale, it was probably okay. Uh, how was the federal government gonna know if you were taking some apples and mashing them up in, in your basement and turning them into to a cider? <laughs> But the goal of prohibition was to prevent that large scale consumption, that, that economic industrial scale consumption of alcohol across the United States. Any other questions? Um, 
Yes. Yeah, uh, just a comment. It's it's ironical in a way that Capone um, got caught uh, on the basis of tax evasion because my understanding. Um, oh, and by the way, I read a book on prohibition, and so much of what you said was not new. But I loved your photos because I didn't have all all of those in what I had read, and and so my understanding was one thing that helped the prohibition get passed was um, in the income tax law came in about that time. So the government wasn't as dependent on, on taxes the excess, right. on, on the, um, on, on alcohol. The, the income tax, the federal income tax is, uh, becomes part of the constitution in 1916. It was either the 16th or the 17th amendment. I can't remember which one. So at that point, the federal government begins collecting an income tax. So it would not have become been as dependent on the excise tax for much of our history, the excise tax and uh, tariffs and duties were how the federal government made money. The, that was the main income. Uh, so when the income tax is implemented in 1916, those other taxes weren't as significant. So getting rid of the excise tax or making alcohol illegal eliminated the excise tax on alcohol may have been counterbalanced by the, by the income tax, as you stated. And of course, the government is always going to get theirs, which is why they got Capone, because of the, the tax uh, avoidance on his part. Um, yeah, my husband has a question. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, GA, what caused the Roaring Twenties? Was that because of the pandemic ending or World War II and, the, and everybody just decided to party? Or did the prohibition have something to do with it also? It was, uh, many, there were many factors. One was that that generation had survived World War I. World War I was right. an indescribable calamity. And many of the soldiers who had been in Europe saw that destruction firsthand and came back and just wanted to celebrate life, celebrate the fact of being alive. So that was one factor that played a role in the idea of the Roaring Twenties. It also had to do with economics. From about 1921 to 1929, the United States entered into an extended period of economic prosperity. People had jobs, people had money. There were new things that were available to people. The automobile becomes a, a major consumer product in the 1920s. Radio becomes a major consumer product in the 1920s. Movies become a major consumer product in the 1920s. So there, was, well, there were all of these new things going on. So you had people who wanted to celebrate life. You had people who had jobs and stability and money in this economic boom time. Boom time. You had new types of music, jazz, for example. Uh, that energized this young generation. So what we see is a combination of all of these factors giving rise to the idea of the Roaring Twenties. You had good times, you had economic stability, you had, um, for most people, again, these, these are generalizations, you had economic prosperity. It led to the, the kind of the effervescence of the 1920s. So what caused the vote to change? You know, he would have these men coming back from the war, you know, and you think they would be able, they, they apparently didn't vote because this was voted in at that time. Was it due because of women's suffrage, the women voted at that time? Was that what really caused? Well, the individual people don't get to vote on the, const are the amendments to the Constitution. Okay. What it is, right. is Congress or the states can come together and push through a proposed amendment and then the individual states themselves have either a constitutional convention or their legislatures vote to accept that. So okay. even if those people who had, who, the men who had come back from war and voted in 1920 didn't necessarily support prohibition, the states had already gone through the process of ratifying it. Okay. Uh, somebody else had a question. Yes, go ahead, Gail. Not Gail, but. Gail's, Gail's computer over here. <laughs> oh, yes, right. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay. All right. There's a, a question about the uh, uh, efforts of uh, the, uh, I'm trying to, I've lost my thought, train of thought. No Give problem. me a moment. Sure. Write it down if you think about it. Anybody else have a question? Uh, yes, uh, I was the one that asked recently. Really? Okay. Yes. Um, 
I'm curious about what other countries thought about all this, um, particularly in Europe, where we know Italy and French were high consumers of wine. Mm -hmm. Then you have other countries, maybe in the Middle East, where due to religious reasons, alcohol was an issue. So what about uh, cross-country comparisons in prohibition? I know in certain countries, it was viewed as an odd thing that the United States was banning alcohol. Uh, places like Europe, you know, Germany is a beer culture. Beer is central yes. to their culture. Uh, it would be almost unthinkable to ban alcohol. Italy and France, wine is essential to their culture. So, uh, you know, a lot of people viewed the United States as kind of, what are they doing? But a lot of people viewed the United States like that anyway, because in the early 20th century, we're, we were, um, I don't like to use the phrase American exceptionalism too much, but we were oftentimes the exception to what was going on in other parts of the world. Um, I know the English thought that it was particularly upper class Englishmen thought it was odd what was going on in the United States. Uh, when famously, when Winston Churchill comes to the United States in the early 1930s, late 1920s, early 1930s, he came with a doctor's prescription saying that he needed to have alcohol every day so that he could avoid the, uh, the ban on alcohol in the United States. So it was an anomaly. It was something that was unusual for westernized countries. Now, in other parts of the world, uh, as you mentioned, in uh, predominantly Muslim countries uh, or certain Asian countries where alcohol wasn't as central, it was not as unusual. But it, the reaction in individual countries, you really have to take a look at those individual countries. But for the most part, I know Europeans thought it an odd thing of what was happening here in the United States with prohibition. Thank if, you. Um, any of you remember the uh, or watched uh, Downton Abbey when it was yes. on PBS? There yeah. was an episode or a couple of episodes where um, the Lord of the Manor, I can't remember his name, is actually in the United States during Prohibition. And when he comes back, he has this discussion with his friends. They're like, you didn't seriously go there and not drink. He was like, no, no, I knew people who had alcohol. So it very much pointed out in, in that one little statement that the English found it odd and that even if alcohol was illegal, there were still ways of acquiring alcohol in the United States. That's right. There were. Yes. There was a. There was. Uh, you you get a doctor's prescription. Mm -hmm. You can go and get alcohol at the drugstore. Right. It was kept in drugstores. It was under lock and key, and you did need a doctor's prescription to get it uh, because it had to be medicinal. So when Churchill came right. over, he was had a prescription for medicinal alcohol. Uh, Churchill, of course, was a fan of the bottle, I guess we could say. Uh, he was yeah. a well-known drinker. <laughs> right. And, and to some extent, um, from what I've read, it certainly broke down uh, along religious lines. And so probably at that point, um, Roman Catholics and certainly Jews were minorities. So um, Jews and Roman Catholics had part of it as religious ceremony. And um, the Roman Catholic German people had, some of those were trying to run uh, breweries. And, mm -hmm. and I believe the, um, the distilleries tended to be run by Jewish people, but the Methodists and Baptists were very, very strong, and the um, the movement, the temperance movement, was especially connected to those churches. And having grown up Methodist, and and um, I'm older than most of you here, um, I remember belonging to a club that went to after school and was mostly a bunch of, and was, I was probably fourth or fifth grade, and it was the Loyal Temperance League. Now, if I probably signed some sort of pledge, but it was long ago broken, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I learned uh, counterproductive things. I remember the, there was as much um, alcohol in one bottle of beer is one shot of whiskey, or suppose, I don't know if that was true. Right. Well, if I ever do drink, I guess I should drink beer, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that was 
a lesson that was meant to be conveyed, you know. My family was not teetotalers. But um, certainly, um, a Methodist clergy until more recently, it's my understanding, I'm no longer Methodist, but um, they no longer have to sign a pledge. But at one time, um, Methodist clergy had to sign a pledge that they would abstain from alcohol. I, I believe it's encouraged now, but not required. Religion did play a large role in the formation of the temperance movement. As I mentioned at the beginning, the, uh, re many of the reform movements that sprang up in the United States in the early 19th century emerge out of what's called the Second Great Awakening, which was this religious revival that sweeps across the United States in the 1830s and 1840s. And you do have uh, the emergence of you know, the Southern Baptist Church at that point and uh, different Protestant denominations that spring up. And many of those groups saw the use of alcohol as, as an evil, as a sin. So the temperance movement really did gain a lot of support, did have a lot of backing by many of these uh, revivalist, um, we can call them evangelical, I guess today, Christian groups that do spring up. There was a religious aspect. There was, as I said, an anti-immigrant aspect also to, yes. to the push for prohibition. That's right. weird. <clears throat> okay, Trump. anybody Anybody else? Good job. Thank you. Uh, hopefully we can get in another one at some point uh, this fall, and, and hopefully at some point we can meet face to face. So uh, thanks for coming right. and listening to me. Um, and uh, stay safe. I, said I really loved all your illustrations. And Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Me too. All right. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right.